afternoon. My name is Giles Bailey. I'm a policy advisor at Via Nova, a mobility management company working globally. As part of our um, industry engagement and thought leadership work, we've been running a series of webinars on the most topical mobility issues. This is our 13th and the others are available via our website. What is a shared micromobility user case? And how can it be used to define, manage, progress uh, effective new mobility solutions in a city? How should these use cases be developed and maintained and who should be involved in their creation and maintenance? As a city, how should we, we be engaging with mobility operators and other industry partners in explaining and managing these use cases? These are some of the questions we're going to investigate in this practical exploration of shared micromobility use cases with a series of global industry leaders who we have today in our webinar. In a change to our promoted lineup, we'll be hearing from the municipality of Amsterdam rather than the municipality of Utrecht uh, due to a speaker being unwell. But again, we have an exciting lineup. We're going to have over the next hour, four short presentations, approximately uh, 10 minutes, with a um, short Q&A with each of the speakers. And this will then be followed by a wider conversation between myself and all of the participants. And at that point, there's absolutely a chance for you to put your questions into the Q&A box, and I'll work them into the uh, conversation actually throughout the webinar. As soon as you have a question, please type it in the Q&A box. And we'll finish off then with final thoughts from our panelists. To start off though, I'd like to welcome Michael Schmuller. Michael is the Director of, the op of Open Source Operations at the Open Mobility Foundation, which is based in the United States. He has been with the OMF for the last two years, and he was previously the Chief Data Officer for the regional government in Louisville, Kentucky in the US for four years. Prior to that, he worked in the tech industry as well as was the founder of his own startup. Over to you, Michael. I'll just advance the slides. Hello, thank you very much for having me today and I'm excited to be on um, such a great panel here uh, to talk about use cases. So, um, as you said, Michael Schnerla, I'm the Director of Open Source Operations for the OMF. Next slide. Um, a little bit about the OMF's vision and our vision are, is sort of like our use cases for the organization. So how we set our, our work. We uh, create digital infrastructure to manage public space for the public good. Um, and that is really data standards and open source tools. And the area that we focus on is regulation and operation of devices within the public right of way. Um, so it's really meant for tools for cities and operators in the public right of way to share information. And we have a public private collaboration setup that allows responsible growth of new mobility services and features in our data specs and across sector relationships that um, create a shared vision for mobility in these areas. Next slide. We have over 50 members, uh, 50 city members, I should say. Here's a few of them here. You could see some in Europe and around the world. Um, we have a few, uh, about a, over a dozen private sector members. And um, you can see complete lists on our website. Um, one thing to point out, our board is made up of all city or public sector entities. And there are a few spaces we're leaving open for more international members, especially in the EU. Next slide. So one of our data specs is the mobility data specification, MDS. And what this is, it's sort of the plumbing layer between governments and, and companies that run devices that are shared in the public right of way. And it's a two-way communication street. It allows cities to publish the regulations digitally, and it allows uh, cities to receive information from providers about their operations. Um, that are all tied to use cases in those cities. Uh, next slide. We have a second data standard called the CURB data 
specification CDS or probably more KDS in the European realm for KERB. But um, this is tangential to MDS, it's not directly connected. What it allows is the definition and publishing of curb spaces and policies around those curb spaces, and then information about usage and activity in those areas that get sent back as metrics to the city and allow for refinements to those curb spaces. And the focus right now is commercial loading zones. And we just released version 1.0. Next slide. So our approach is a, a collaboration between local governments, mobility providers, and software companies. We work in the open. All of our working group meetings are public. Uh, all the work we do is on GitHub, which is also public. We have a governance structure to help approve the releases through our, our membership of cities and private companies. And the new use cases that get added to the spec come from the MDS spec users in the real world. So ever since the OMF was created, there hasn't been a feature that had, did not start from a use case in the real world. And in many, many cases, it's already being used in this way in the real world. And we're trying to bring it back into the official MDS specification. Uh, so these features are added collectively and then adopted by the community. Next slide. One of our latest features in our latest release, which was uh, in October, is something called requirements, which is part of our policy section of MDS. And this allows cities to specify and receive only the data fields that they need for their use cases. So on the left here, you can see some a, a situation of MDS typically required fields, uh, start location of devices and end location and the route. Um, it, this requirements feature allows you to add optional fields that you may want as a, as, an oper as a city from operators for your use cases, like maybe a parking photograph or uh, the cost of the trip. But maybe more importantly, it allows you to disallow fields that are traditionally required within MDS. So you could specify that you don't want the start location or the route or the device ID, and you just want some other information about trips. Um, you can specify this down to the field level and disallow fields or endpoints uh, that you don't or don't want or are not allowed to collect or don't need for your program or your use cases. Next slide. We also have a use case database uh, where we track uh, real world um, use cases that uh, of how cities want to use MDS specifically. Um, it identifies for each use case the APIs and endpoints used to achieve the goals for those use cases. So it's a good place to browse what's possible. We've recorded 45 of these and we welcome others. There's a method to add your own if you're interested. Next slide. Um, and of course you can't talk about use cases without privacy because privacy is something to consider with all of your use cases. So with MDS, um, vehicles and the riders themselves generate a lot of data and all that data goes to the private companies that operate those services. Um, through MDS, we get a, the cities get a sliver of that data, some vehicle data, some trip data. Um, and around that, we have developed a number of privacy resources. You can see four of them at the bottom there. We have a general privacy guide for cities. Um, we have a mobility data state of practice where we track best practices across the industry. Uh, we have the breakdown of the data within MBS and what is considered sensitive potentially. And then also for the curb data spec, we have a privacy guide as well. Next slide. And most importantly, and probably to this audience, we also have guidance for using MDS under GDPR. Um, this is a very detailed 75 page breakdown of many common questions under GDPR that we um, we developed with a lawyer and I know Villanova actually helped with this as well. Um, so it answers a lot of common questions about how to use MDS um, within the context of GDPR. So we welcome you to look at that on our website. Next slide. And then I think I'll just touch on one use case before I hand it over. Um, this is a use case in Los Angeles. So they of course can get trip data and here you just see points, uh, bird's eye view, uh, points, starts and end uh, trips. And what they do is they then track that to census tracks and Los Angeles Metro rail stations 
so that they can see how to optimize infrastructure to make sure that people that are using it to theoretically, they don't know exactly, but to probably get to a metro station because that's where the trip ended or started, that they can make sure that there's proper infrastructure in the city that can get people to and from those census tracts to the metro rail stations. Um, so they use this um, as they develop their plan for the city. That's it. Thank you very much, Michael. And again, uh, Michael provided a whole series of user cases. <laughs> I was only able to choose one. So I think the, the LA Metro one highlighted some of the issues. I, I mean, there are a range of questions, but I'll just probably start on one. You identified a tension between what cities think they may want to collect and what they literally can collect around MDS issues, privacy issues, and so on. Perhaps just can you elaborate a little bit more on kind of your experience and thinking of how cities um, tackle that challenge and that thought process in, again, what they want, but what is actually practical to connect from some of your experience? Yeah, I think, so MDS was built, has always been built as what we call a kit of parts. So it, it can be used in, in its entirety or in pieces. And that's something really important for cities to consider and cities I think over the years, especially in the last two years, have really started to consider that when they ask for MDS data, instead of just asking for, I want MDS, which is really just a huge bucket of options. They get more specific by specifying which parts of MDS they want. And they, with our privacy guide, many cities have used that to help look at and define use cases so that they know what to ask for. Um, the, uh, the use case database has also been used by cities to see what's possible and to then look through that to see what they need. And then from that, determine which pieces of MDS they want. Um, the, uh, the, the other part of it, which I mentioned briefly in the slides is the requirements API, and we're seeing some more adoption of that. But just by using the requirements API, by defining this digital file that says what you have available and what you'd like from the operators, that is an exercise in and of itself for cities to think about what do you really need? And they have to actually define those things in that file down to the field level if they'd like. So we encourage cities to use that and, and we've seen a little bit of adoption there um, across the world actually. And I will say it, it's, being used more in Europe uh, right now than in the United States. Excellent, Michael. And again, we'll come back to some of those thoughts in the following presentations in the general discussion. But I'd like to move on to our next speaker now and bring her into the discussion. So I'd like to um, introduce Tu Tho Tai. Tu Tho is the Director of Partnerships and Events at Mobility Data. They are registered in Montreal, Canada, but as well as in Paris, France, where she works. Tutho has been with the organization over the last year. She oversees Mobility Data's actions team and partnerships in Europe and international markets with a focus on public entities. With a double master's in industrial engineering and business development, she's passionate about making the world a better place to live and uh, leaning in on new technologies and community inclusion. Having spent a decade in Southeast Asia, she strongly believes in the future must be written globally with learnings from each other. Welcome to Tho. Thank you, Gilles. Well, you pretty much introduced everything I had on, myself, uh, on the slide for myself. Thank you very much. <laughs> we'll definitely make up some time here for questions. So as Gilles said, I'm really passionate about learning from local communities. And that's why I also pride myself in uh, learning as many languages as I can. So you can reach out to me in French, English, Vietnamese, Spanish, and Japanese. And if you stumble upon a language I don't know, I'm pretty sure I can try and figure out to discuss with you your specific use case because we're here to discuss that today. So now if we move on to use case and cities and the topic that we're addressing today, well, before we dive into the use cases and browse some of uh, the one presented by, the, by Michael for the Open Mobility Foundation and others that will follow, I would like to invite everyone in the audience to take a step back. Um, because I think it's very much important that we want to look at a more global picture. So cities, I will ask you one question that 
admittedly, I stole from my uh, product manager team and their reference book. And I think it's an important question that they always ask themselves and we should apply to ourselves and to cities when we start attacking this um, world of data and analysis and so on is which problems, which question are you trying to solve? It, I know it sounds very, very basic, but this is the key to actually define uh, your use case and where you stand uh, into the, the, all the data you collect. As Michael said, you can't just ask for one format because then you have way too many options and you're losing track of what kind of question you need to ask yourself. And with that question always in your mind of what, which problem, which question, I am trying to solve as a representative of the mobility department of my city or the open data department of the city or the urban planning de uh, uh, department of the city or the citizen engagement, then this will inform every single step of your involvement with your partners, your mobility operators, the third parties who are going to provide you with analytics and so on and so on. It will also inform the RFP that you write toward them to make sure that is highlighted the answers that you need. And that it can always be an evolutive list of question and problem. And some of them can even be related to one another. And if I may, to the urban planners in the room, you all know that everything is related and that's the beauty of your field. So now that you have this list of question, that live either in your brain or in a shared file, wherever you want, use the tool you want, you are now ready to talk data to the people like Open Mobility Foundation, like Vianova, like other cities like the city of Amsterdam we have here, or even to us mobility data with other standards. And you can ask them, okay, I want to solve a question. For example, I want to know how much of shared mobility is used in my city then maybe they will tell you that the right data to ask for is a consolidated number of trips per operator and not necessarily the, all the endpoints or all the data. If you're wondering what kind of peak hours COVID has created in your city with new mobility, people working more from home, flexible hours, then maybe what you need is to have trends on a global usage of trips of operators. Like, is it more between nine and 12 now that people are not rushing to get to work at 8 30 we don't know if you're on the in the working uh you're working in an urban planning uh team maybe you want to define what is the next infrastructure you need to create and then you don't need any of that but you might need a global trend from operators and station and location a little bit like the craft that uh, michael showed us and you realize that some streets are taken more by uh, global shared mobility users. And on these streets, maybe you need to create a new bike way, a new cycling lane, or, uh, or maybe just traffic light to prevent accidents. And if you're working in a procurement department, maybe your question is, are all the operators actually compliant with the contracts they sign? Then it's a completely different story. You need a completely different set of data. So it was a couple of questions and examples to showcase to you how different the angles can be when you request data and when you build your own um, use case. So on the next slide, I will give you the three main steps that I believe that every single city uh, should get involved in when it comes to defining use cases with your partners, because you are the very center of it. You are the public space on which all of us working in a mobility environment are playing with. And you must make sure that you are the one who supports a thriving ecosystem in the mobility world. And for that, the, these three steps are to make sure that you a point of view is taken into account when it's built, uh, but also when the use case are maintained and used because life changes. So at the conception stage, well, first, do not be afraid to ask your partners based on the question, the list of questions you had. Come with them with all the list of questions and ask them, okay, now, how do we solve this? Is there any of it that you can solve easily without any hurdle? If yes, what it is, what does it look like? Does it look like 
I don't know, a collection of numbers, a collection of hours? Does it look like a map? Uh, and how do I get this info? Do I get it daily? Do I get monthly? Do I get it, I don't know, every six months? And by sharing these needs with your partners, you're informing their work and make sure that they spend less time trying to guess what you need and more time working with you to actually make it beneficial to the citizen. Then once all these use cases have been conceived, they need to be maintained because they will be the flow of data that you receive day after day after day. So keep an eye on what you have asked, make sure that you stay in the loop and share the required change. Because as I said, we didn't know that COVID would hit and we would be here online doing webinars when usually what we would do is just meet in a room and discuss and maybe share a nice coffee. Uh, everything changed. And when you realize that you're not really getting the data you want or you have questions that are changing, uh, new questions that pop up, let them know. Let them know immediately so you can actually work together on maintaining these use cases and keeping them relevant rather than stacking data upon open data that doesn't get used and actually has a huge carbon footprint. And the last um, step, and I guess this is why, uh, sorry, may I have the previous slide? Sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> that is why it's so important that uh, Gemma and Eduardo from the city of Amsterdam have joined us today. As a city, as representatives of city and local authorities, share. Share with your partners what you have learned, your feedback, all your inputs are important, but share with other cities. The same way that the city of Amsterdam is very proactive, uh, all the cities are only willing to get the best practices from you, the best inputs, because some of them can be reused. And we're here to help each other grow and learn. And it's actually how we can build what is on my next slide, which is trust. Because at the end of the day, as a city, what you need is to make sure that there is trust between you and your operators and partners, but also you and the citizens. After all, we are all here for to make all the travelers uh, mobility more sustainable, more reliable through high quality data with in a, presented in a standard way so they can make their own choice when it comes to moving from A to B seamlessly and it can only be built on trust. And when you push for more data, when you push for public data, when you push for open data, the citizen can actually see what you're doing as a city, they trust you more. And with that trust, you can then in return, trust your operators and partners as the one who finally are on the ground to help you create uh, a better, sustainable, hopefully more green uh, mobility. And basically that's it for me. I don't have any use cases to present you, but I just want to let you know that all use cases are good if they're useful to you. Thank you very much, Satutho. And again, you, you, you highlight this issue of trust, again, particularly we could come to the end of your last slide. I'd like to explore that a little bit more and maybe a little bit more of an explanation of when trust breaks down, what the kind of consequences are for a city thinking about new mobility solutions and any kind of, um, I suppose, generalized or specific examples you might be able to give of that, that again of breaking down of trust and actually how difficult it can be for cities. Well, I guess for cities, if, uh you are working directly with uh, anyone who has uh, been elected in a position of uh, governance in a city, then the first breakdown is with the citizen. If, because in any city, they will pay taxes for you to maintain some infrastructure when it comes to mobility. And if they can't see changes while they've been reporting it, asking for it, and they don't even have the data, it's when you first lose trust in them. And if the citizens don't put trust in you, if they keep on commenting on social media of how bad a job you're doing, then, well, actually, you might lose your job or the next election, and you might have a big, great plan that will never happen again. Uh, and that's actually, it happened more than once to other cities. And I always feel bad because it's more often than not the most innovative or visionary people who get issues with 
translating what they want uh, towards the citizen. And I think a second break in trust is between cities and operators. And it's where uh, both uh, the Open Mobility Foundation and Mobility Data, that's why we're advocating for uh, data to be shared between operators and cities and more open data, is if you're always trying to think that your partners will find a way to cheat on your contract, then you will not get anywhere. Uh, you, you, as a city, you can't run all the mobility operations. You need to trust that uh, the data you get is actually a reflection of what's happening on the ground, but you also should share with them in advance if you're looking into, for example, in a train station to build a, a mobility hub then maybe your partners will come up with solutions that have platform that they can share between several operators or a way to represent it in the data. So it is actually a level playing field for everyone. And all these are beneficial at the end for the end users. Thank you very much. And again, that issue of trust, again, how operators, cities work together and actually work with their stakeholders. We're going to actually dive in a little more detail to actually hear from a specific city now and the municipality of Amsterdam. And we have two speakers. Um, so I'll introduce them both. And I think then Gemma will do the presentation and we'll, we'll have a conversation with both speakers. So we have uh, Gemma Sheppers and Eduardo Green, both from the municipality of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Gemma is the project leader in smart mobility for the municipality and she's held that position for the last three years. She has a 13 year though career with Amsterdam in various roles in mobility and broader public service. And prior to that, she worked in various roles in the Dutch national government. We also have Eduardo Green, and he's been a mobility innovation manager within the smart mobility team for the last two years. He had previously worked for, um, uh, in consumer goods, um, sorry, consumer goods in the chemical and manufacturing industries, as well as for eight years in internal audit functions. Again, Gemma will deliver the presentation and then we'll hear from a conversation with both speakers. Over to you, Gemma. Gemma, we can't hear you yet. Uh, you might be on mute. Thank you for um, inviting the city of Amsterdam to join this presentation. Also very uh, interesting to hear um, uh, Michael speaking about the uh, uh, MDS because we're working also with parts of the MDS and also um, uh, for mobility data. I keep it very short on what we're doing because I think the most interesting now is to uh, explain that we have use cases. So if I can have this, this, the second slide. At this moment in the Netherlands, we're having uh, uh, six uh, cities which are we are running use cases, um, and we designed the use cases. I think we started in June last year, and we did it step by step. Uh, we do it together with the ministry, uh, the six cities, and also with uh, Via Nova as the data processor, and together with all the uh, mobility providers in the city. And we, what we want to do actually is to really test and learn and experience how use cases actually are working. Um, if I can have the next slide. Uh, for us, it's very uh, important to restart from the beginning because we are very, uh, uh, we want to uh, keep the environment for all the citizens very safe. So uh, uh, privacy is a very important part of starting use cases and we don't want to exchange that much data, only the data that we actually need. So then. The question for us is how do we start when we actually are going to have a use case? If I can um, have slide six, I go a little bit quicker. Um, for us, it's very important to really start to do all the DPA, to make the security framework, can I have the next slide, to also uh, make an NDA, to do the do, do, do diligence and to get all the proceeding um, agreements. So we want to actually make sure everything in front when we start the use case actually um, fits and uh, we make sure that we protect the privacy of the citizens. That's how we start. Um, can I have the next slide? We do it because if we don't protect the privacy of our citizens, we actually can um, see patterns of people in the city. We can see what the habits are. We can see how people are traveling. And we, can, we actually can identify, identify uh, persons and that is not really what we want, especially not when you combine more and more data later on. So 
Um, because we don't want to exchange that much data, we really start from the beginning and the process flow of starting the use case, if I can have the next slide, is actually uh, one slide uh, later. Um, next slide. Yeah, we really start with the, no, one back. Uh, we really start with the use case. Yes, this one. We really start with the use case and we ask ourselves the question, what is the questions, what are the data you need to solve the policy question that you have in the city? And the water will explain a little bit more about that. Actually, from that question, we identify the data items that we need. There we build on all the agreements, the standards, the contracts, um, the permits for the, um, the mobility transport operators. And then actually, we, when we make the DPA, when we do all the processing, when we do the security checks, when we are done with that, then actually we can exchange the data. And at this moment in the Netherlands, we are running, we now at the time, at the moment that we are exchanging all the data together with the transport operators, together with Via Nova on a technical level. And now we are having the data, then we're going to analyze all the data and then we have all the results. And when we have the results, we can actually answer the question that we ask ourselves in the beginning of the process, when we're starting the use case, what is the policy question uh, you actually want to uh, answer? And if you can have the next slide, we use always um, a standard uh, template for it. And we help cities in the Netherlands to uh, go to uh, all those questions. And Ada Warder always helps us with all those questions. And I think from this point of view, we really want to uh, build from the beginning the use cases. And this is a very intensive process. Uh, we actually underestimated a little bit. We start in June and now it's already uh, March. So it's a long uh, way. Um, but I think all the learnings that we will have, we, we will present this later on this year. And I think we can then make the next step uh, into Europe to um, represent everyone the lessons that we learned and how we approach this. And I think that's very um, helpful for the next yeah, step to make. And I want to give the floor to Eduardo because he is, um, did all the processes together with the cities uh, on designing the use cases. And I think that it can be really interesting for everyone to, um, yeah, to learn and to know how we're doing, how we are doing it. Yes, thank you, Gemma. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, look, as a service designer working for the municipality of Amsterdam, I, uh, I feel like I'm going to repeat a lot of things of what Tito just said here previously. Um, it is, I, I had planned that maybe I could uh, demonstrate to you uh, via a, a mural that I've made on how we actually try to facilitate the cities in defining these use cases, but I don't think I've sent it through in, in enough time. But nonetheless, it doesn't really matter too much. The, the process is fundamentally the same, and it really is that case that we do need to start with a problem. It always has to start with a problem. What is the problem that we're trying to solve? And what is the outcome that we're trying to achieve from that problem? And again, that sounds like a little bit of a rudimentary thing because you would think that that's relatively simple to be able to, to say, you know, but you'd actually be surprised at how incredibly hard and complex it is to try and get cities to truly understand what it is the problem that they want to solve. So it starts with that task element and then it flows on to that process and sort of saying, well, what is it that we want to do? How do we want to effectively accomplish these goals? And then it finally concludes with that relationship part that says, you know, how do we actually go around doing this? Now, we've conducted workshops in the past where we have brought together the five largest cities of the Netherlands. And we've really tried to take policy makers from these cities. And we've tried to sort of map the process flows to understand at how policy and planning decisions are being made and what data they are using to be able to inform those policy and planning decisions. And what you really realize as outcomes of this is that there's a real big difference between the ways in which cities operate versus, for example, the commercial world. And uh, you know, if you take the commercial world, companies are dictated by processes. They're quite process oriented in what they do. And that's really not the case in cities. You know, Cities have quite bottom up structures in the way that they manage themselves. And, uh, and the reality is, is that there isn't really any kind of processes which dictate the terms on how policymakers actually make policy and planning decisions and what kind of data is actually informing 
those policy and planning decisions. And that's a real challenge because when you actually sit down with the cities and say, well, let's talk about that problem. Let's try and understand what that problem is. It's sometimes even difficult for cities to really truly understand what it is that they're trying to solve. What you often come across is that they can define problems where actually they're quite simplistic in nature insofar as that if they just did a little bit more research themselves with available existing sources of data, then they could probably actually come to some of those conclusions. And what's really, really important, of course, when we talk about defining these use cases is that we need to make them city centric. And each city, of course, has got different problems. Um, but in, ideally, of course, we want them to be working on a problem which is relevant to their city. And it takes an awful lot of asking why, you know? And to give you one quick example, we worked together with one city that explained that they were, they wanted to know how, what is the average amount of distance that uh, somebody needs to walk in order to access a shared car? Uh, and then the question is, well, why? Well, why do you want to know that? Why do you want to know how long it takes for someone to access the shared car? Uh, and it sort of follows on these series of questions where you really need to try and really help and guide the process to understand what is the problem that you're truly trying to solve here? And then when you can try and actually crack that notion of saying, well, okay, now we've hit the nail on the head. Now we're getting somewhere. This is truly a relevant problem for your city. How then is it, you know, that data is going to be able to inform and help you to be able to solve that problem? And why is it that you don't have access to that data now? What is it that we need to be able to provide to you, to show to you, to be able to help you to inform those, palace, those policy and planning decisions. So it's not as simple as we might think. It indeed starts with that formulation of a problem. It starts with that question of, uh, you know, how are we going to do this? Uh, and it starts really with a, a lot of, a lot of uh, asking really why and why it is a relevant, uh, a relevant problem for their city. Um, could have been nice to actually have shown you some things, but I'll leave it at that. No, no, thank you very much, Eduardo and Gemma. And again, some lots of very good insight and, uh, and practical thought in there as well in both uh, presentations effectively. The, the question, I mean, I think we'll come back to this more generally, but I mean, you know, people in the, the administration of the city are, you know, all goodwill and so on. But what could you kind of, as your top tip for facilitating those productive conversations with other departments and other parts of your organization, Kind of, what would be your top tip to actually get to that point where you really define that robust user case? You know, is it why, or are there other critical conversations or ways of having conversations that you need to have with your stakeholders? I or think it stakeholders? starts with a future vision, right? And uh, and it's also a little bit of a problem for cities too, you know, because if you ask twelve different people about what type of city do we want to be, you'll get thirteen different answers, uh, and that's a real challenge in its own right. But uh, it really does take that notion to say, well, think about your city, you know, you've got these visions, you've got these things that you want to achieve, you're telling people about what there is, you want to build low car neighborhoods, you want to build uh, whatever it may be, there, there, there's a number of different, uh, different cases out there. But have you actually ever thought about uh, the steps that are going to be needed in order to get there? And have you actually ever thought about uh, why it is that you want to truly actually create these kinds of different neighborhoods or communities. Gemma? Thank you. And Gemma, obviously to you as well. <laughs> yeah, I think it's also um, when, when Eduardo always helps us with having all these talks with the cities, uh, we sometimes are still surprised on the knowledge level uh, on cities on how to approach this kind of questions. That means that we sometimes need to go back with them and have talks for three or four times all over again to uh, help them to think in the way we are doing to define uh, uh, a use case uh, that makes it also a little bit the process that makes the process longer because they don't always uh, have the same vision on how to approach this um, and yeah we're repeating uh, sometimes the questions a uh, few times excellent some very very practical advice and again, I'm going to go on to our last speaker now, then kind of open it up to more general questions and discussion. So uh, I'd like to welcome Alex Bohajniks, and he's the head of policy and partnerships at Villanova, where he helps cities maintain their mobility, uh, sorry, uh, meet their mobility challenges through innovative uh, use of data and policy. 
Additionally, he serves as the district director of the Young Professionals in Transportation in Western Europe. Previously, he was the mobility solutions manager for the city of Seattle, where he managed sustainable, shared, electric, and autonomous uh, vehicle programs. And he was also the former uh, assistant director of policy planning and permitting in the city of Pittsburgh's Department of Mobility and Infrastructure. Uh, and he and the lead author of Pittsburgh's Smart City Vision. Uh, welcome, Alex. Thank you, Giles. Uh, next slide. Uh, so I will uh, attempt to move um, uh, relatively quickly. Uh, I think a lot has been uh, discussed, and I think part of my goal is to synthesize uh, this uh, this concept. Uh, the first is, um, you know, my take perhaps on uh, what has been discussed uh, before around um, what are we trying to accomplish. Uh, and, and I think when, when we work with cities, uh, it's really important to have essentially vertical integration um, between uh, the, the vision for uh, program management, um, the, the goals, the, the outcomes um, that a, a city is trying to uh, see, what, what constitutes success, uh, in other words. Um, the particular questions, the queries that, that can be asked um, and answered uh, using data. Um, and then ultimately the metrics that are necessary in order to answer those questions. Uh, and I think often uh, challenges come with use cases uh, when there's misalignment uh, or misinterpretation between uh, these four building blocks, uh, but it's quite critical uh, to make sure that uh, you, whether you are going top down or bottom up, uh, that there is a, a stack um, uh, of these four, uh, four important features. Uh, next slide. Uh, the reality is, uh, you know, the we are talking about the the process of of collecting data, um, either for uh, for management purposes or for uh, analysis or uh, engineering. Uh, data is expensive, uh, both in terms of time and resources, uh, and uh, computational power, um, but also in in terms of uh, interpretation. Uh, it takes a lot to go from uh, particularly the, the raw data that um, in the context of this uh, panel uh, is generated by, by shared mobility trips uh, into actual uh, insight, intelligence, uh, you know, things that uh, allow decision makers to make decisions. Uh, and so it's quite critical uh, to make sure that we are uh, managing uh, a reasonable number of use cases uh, at any given time. Uh, next slide. Um, the, uh, I think uh, Eduardo touched on this, um, but I think it's quite important to uh, recognize that a, a use case development is not a linear process. Um, uh, this, uh, you know, this could be cogs, uh, but instead is just blobs. Uh, and I think that is, uh, that is representative of some of the challenge in um, use case design uh, around shared mobility. Uh, in particular, I think um, this is a, a relatively new field for all of us, right? Um, in uh, 10 years ago, uh, ITS was sort of limited to uh, um, uh, signal timing and uh, um, information on, on highways, real-time information on highway display boards. Uh, all of a sudden, ITS, or sort of the idea of uh, data-informed uh, transport managing, uh, transport management has sort of moved from this, uh, this niche uh, into the center of uh, transportation engineering, transportation planning, uh, and frankly, policymaking and, and political decisions. Uh, and so it's quite important to, uh, to recognize that uh, there are a number of uh, dialects essentially being spoken uh, within an organization uh, about what a use case is. Uh, and it, uh, it's quite critical uh, to make sure that there's, uh, there are people um, who are filling that role as translator uh, and making sure that there is a, there's a better understanding that when a city planner says X, uh, that it means the same thing to uh, to the attorney uh, or vice versa. Uh, next slide. Uh, so if uh, if you can take only one tool uh, from from this panel, I think the most important one is is this sentence here. Um, as a blank, uh, I want or need to be able to blank. Uh, so that blank. Um, this uh, this sentence is really fundamental to the process of use case design. Um, again, it's sort of important to remember that uh, the use case process, the concept, uh, kind of comes to uh, the public sector from, from product ownership, from software development, uh, from these uh, very process-laden uh, processes, uh, process-laden uh, um, entities, uh, whereas uh, government uh, tends to be uh, more chaotic, and I say that charitably uh, as, a, uh, as a recovering uh, um, government, uh, government employee. Uh, it's really critical to have that simple structure uh, to be able to define 
um, you know, why you are doing an activity, um, what the outcome that is expected uh, of, you know, whatever this data um, accessibility allows you to do, um, and what the ultimate sort of end state, um, what constitutes success. Um, if you can answer those questions, uh, you can really start to drill down into some of these smaller questions or, or sub questions uh, about um, how you are precise uh, in the data that is uh, available or achievable um, for your purposes. Uh, next slide. Uh, so I think a, a final few notes. Um, it's important to kind of acknowledge uh, that use cases are uh, both political with a small p and political with a big p. Uh, by that, I mean, uh, in the absence of uh, process, um, let's say most uh, public sector entities uh, turn to uh, turn to the thing they know best, uh, which is uh, sort of discussion, deliberation, and consensus building. Uh, it's important to recognize that that will be a part of a use case process uh, in, in any city, um, but they are, are also uh, political with a capital P. Uh, and by that, I mean, uh, the, the city has an obligation uh, to, uh, to serve its citizens uh, and to respond to citizen needs. Uh, so you will um, frequently see uh, a level of interaction with, uh, with elected officials, um, with the general public uh, around, uh, in particular, you know, shared and connected vehicle management uh, that you don't often see with, uh, with other forms of transport. Uh, and it's, it's sort of worth uh, making sure that uh, the, the teams that are working on these projects are uh, appropriately armored, let's say, uh, to, be, uh, to be engaged in that kind of discussion. Um, second is um, being explicit about what constitutes success uh, and what it means uh, to kind of complete a use case. Um, maybe completing uh, ultimately means an ongoing thing, right? We want to be able to have uh, data in order to um, appropriately monitor a situation uh, or in order to build the next generation of uh, psychopaths, right? Uh, one of those is perhaps perpetual. Um, one of them is uh, discrete um, and, and perhaps can have a a start and end time. Um, the third is uh, acknowledging that use cases evolve uh, over time. Uh, mm -hmm. Often people begin with a, a perception of what a use case um, will do or what um, data is necessary uh, to achieve a use case and realize uh, after they have it um, that it's, uh, it, it is not what they were looking for or it doesn't meet that need. Um, and so both cities and operators need to be comfortable with the idea of uh, there being evolution within uh, within moderation uh, in order to uh, achieve that ultimate end goal uh, in the statement uh, that in the use case statement that uh, that I described previously. Um, and then finally, uh, don't chase use cases uh, just because the data exists. Um, this gets back to uh, the idea that, um, you know, in it, likewise in software development or product ownership, uh, everything is a, is a set of prioritizations. Uh, and if everything is a priority, nothing is a priority. Uh, it's important to, uh, to be discreet uh, about which use cases are the ones that deserve the most time, attention, uh, effort in trying to complete. Uh, otherwise, you you run the risk run the risk uh, of only having partially satisfied uh, use cases, and uh, therefore, uh, uh, you know, quite unsatisfied stakeholders. Uh, that's uh, that's all I've got. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, a whole series of questions. We have about twelve more minutes, so I'm going to ask you a very tactical question, Alex, and maybe also open it up to the rest of the panel. Who should own the user case in the structure of? good city governance and actually kind of capturing your ideas about robust and reliable long-term user cases. And actually, while you're thinking, while you're doing that answer, I'm going to ask then everybody for some exciting, innovative, well-thought-out user cases, some specific examples. But Alex, if you start with the ownership one. Yeah, I, I think uh, ultimately in, in many cities, uh, you have uh, someone who's sort of serving as the uh, the de facto program manager around uh, around shared mobility. Uh, it's interesting, you know, they they come from different places. Uh, when I started, I sort of came from the political side. Uh, others are planners that got turned into program managers. Others are the IT person or uh, you know the the active mobility coordinator, whatever it is. Um, there's typically a a person um, sort of in that role. Um, and the reality is like they they own the use case. Um, now, whether they decide the use case is perhaps something else. Uh, and that's where um, that role of, of kind of deliberation and consensus building comes in. Um, but it is, uh, I think, uh, quite critical to, to at the very least uh, have someone within the organization who's serving as a repository of the collective needs 
uh, of the the various facets of the organization um, and is is doing their best uh, to kind of synthesize uh, and, and and consolidate those um, into a um, into a discrete program. Thank you, Alex. And let's look back. So we had a question for Philip Kreese, which has disappeared for a second, but I'll come back to that. Let's look back to the other panelists. This question particularly of exciting, innovative, well thought out user cases. Is it possible to give a relatively short synopsis of some that you see? Uh, let's start with Tutho and then we'll go to the other panelists. So I think if we go back to who owned the use cases, I think it would be a little bit of both the operators and the cities in the sense that the cities as uh, everyone said in the panel will tell what questions they're trying to solve. So that's the start of the use case. And then the operators and also the standardization body, uh, such as OMF here in the room or ourselves mobility data, we can inform what is possible as of today. And it almost brings back to the question I typed to uh, Philip around his question, bottom up or bottom, uh, top down or bottom up. I think it needs to be both because uh, a standard such as that MDS has evolved a lot uh, through the past years with all the different questions that came from GDPR, but also cities asking for different use cases. Same with GPFS, with operators asking us to represent new realities. We make the Finally, we make the standards change. We add more options. So at the end of the day, it comes with use cases that belong a little bit of both. Then it will never be perfect. And that's why I think we, they should be continuously changing to make sure that they actually adapt to the reality. Thank you. And Michael, then we'll go to um, uh, Amsterdam. Uh, innovative, yeah. exciting, well thought out. Exciting use cases. Yeah. I, I, I think maybe I'll try to think of some use cases that maybe people don't talk about as much, which is the, instead of receiving data from companies, uh, it's publishing the data. So, I mean, the requirements that I mentioned is one part of that, but there's also ways with GBFS and with MDS to publish publicly um, all sorts of things, like where your, one, to one of the questions in the Q&A, like where your docking stations are and the capacity of those, or where your operating area is, what your city's jurisdiction is compared to your neighboring cities, um, which helps the operators a lot, where the slow speed zones are, the no ride, the no parking, the preferred parking areas, the equity areas, the distribution zones, all those use cases can be defined with these data specs as well. And I think that sort of sharing of information publicly from the, the uh, cities and regional entities, I think is an important use case, those are important use cases to keep in mind when we're talking about this. Excellent. I see Alex is nodding vigorously. So before I go to Gemma and Mark Wardo, Alex, do you want to add something? Yeah, I think the 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 one that I would add that I think is quite critical and and Michael touched on this a little bit, but um the 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 question of uh, integration or, or synthesis of uh, these disparate modes is something that I think uh, is a use case um, that is still uh, Everyone is defining it slightly differently, but uh, trying to approach the problem um, in really unique ways, um, whether it's uh, trying to uh, analyze the, the sort of um, the replacement versus uh, complement role of shared mobility with public transport, um, or thinking about the, the infrastructure improvement that's necessary in order to uh, kind of match the, uh, the digital connection of mobility as a service. Uh, I think that there is a, there's a really compelling use case uh, in virtually every city about, you know, now uh, new mobility is no longer new, um, but it's just another mobility option. Um, so what does that mean for uh, for the operations of the system uh, as a whole? Thank you. And uh, Gemma and Eduardo, new, innovative, exciting user cases, some best examples you think you've seen. I think you're on mute, Gemma, if you were speaking. Uh, I do. Um, well, if I if I want to, um, well, I really agree what everyone's saying. I mean, before we can have a successful use case, uh, we cannot do it by ourselves as a city. We really need uh, the transport operators to help us. We also need the um, uh, data uh, uh, processor companies to exchange the data, and we need um, uh, companies that are developing uh, standards to actually make sure that we can exchange data on a technical level. 
So I think this whole ecosystem needs to work together to make the next steps and to really um, make sure that you uh, have good use cases. Um, even if a city always, I think, from a city perspective, is the owner because you are responsible, responsible for your citizens that you exchange the data from. But I think without the ecosystem working together, I think we, are, we cannot really uh, have good use cases. And Eduardo, did you want to add something as well? Yes, I suppose I can just keep it relatively boring in terms of uh, <laughs> uh, going with more of the standard things. I mean, if I look at some of the ambitions that the city has, for example, we are planning to try and create low car neighborhoods where there's a maximum of one car per five households. We, of course, uh, are looking at a very changing landscape in the way cities are being structured. We have chosen in Amsterdam that we will not allow uh, step scooters uh, in our cities because we've seen the consequences of what happens when these things run riot within our, uh, our neighbors in Europe. Um, and there needs to be some structure around these things too. So for us, it's important as well to really understand about how assets are being used, informing how hub locations are going to be uh, uh, placed around the cities, about how the electric revolution is going to define things in terms of decarbonization um, and, uh, and how we actually start uh, evolving, if you will, the public space to accommodate these new types that are uh, ever increasing. Thank you. And again, sadly, time is running short because we have a whole thing I wanted to talk about. I'd like to ask a very practical question though, again, to, again, to bring the debate down to you, again, practical advice for the audience. How many user cases should you be coming up with as a city? I mean, not necessarily the, the specific number, but is there a, a thought process or a debate to not do too many that you just kind of get lost in a long list of, it'd be nice to know everything. And again, I'll throw that open to the floor. Anybody would like to start off with that? Perhaps Alex, I think you're about to speak. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I can take a, a quick stab. I think um, there there's sort of two universes often when we're talking about shared mobility. Uh, the first is um, in situations like in the United Kingdom right now, where uh, every uh, every shared mobility program is a is a trial, um, and there's a there's a need to kind of assess or evaluate um, the trial before a a long term kind of scheme, a long term program comes into effect. Uh, I think in those cases, you know, it it is um, quite important to uh, have uh, have answers to uh, all of the questions that are necessary at the very least to kind of get to should this trial be renewed uh, or or sort of made permanent. Um, but when you think about sort of a long term multi year uh, program, uh, I think it's uh, it's quite important uh, to uh, to eat the elephant one bite at a time. Um, and you know, when when you think about other uh, uh, initiatives that a transport department might be running, whether it's Vision Zero or, um, you know, Im improving the the infrastructure for for active mobility, uh, they're not trying to do everything at once, right? Uh, and I think it's uh, it's quite important with shared mobility uh, as well. Again, just because the data exists, uh, that the data will likely be there uh, in the future. Um, uh, and in many cases, you can kind of do the uh, the analysis in a historic sense anyway. It's more meaningful with uh, with a more historic sense of data. Uh, so in, uh, I, I don't want to give a number. Uh, I'm still uh, still a, a political guy at heart. Um, so I would say the, the number is uh, is sort of the right number for you. Excellent. And again, it's time starting short. So I'm going to leave that question open and go through the rest of the panel. But actually, if you'd like to give your, your final kind of wrap up thoughts and advice for cities as well. And I'm going to start with Michael. So how many, but also your, your overall thoughts on, on use cases? Yeah, um, I, I also don't know if there's, you know, having been a data analyst and working with data in cities, I don't know if there's a, when we've done these exercises with departments, even outside of the transportation space, I wouldn't say we put a number on them. So it is a lot more um, defining what the needs are for the person running the program, um, which I think is also the person that should own the use cases. Um, so yeah, and then to wrap up, I think, um, I'll leave it short, but yeah, yeah use cases are very important. I, I love what, uh, Gemma and Amsterdam are doing with leading with use cases. And I feel like that's what most cities should do, should be doing and have a framework for that. So leading with them to get to where you want to be with the data, I think is the way to go. Thank you, Michael. And Tutho, um, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think. The, the number will also depend on top of what Alex has said uh, very beautifully of the size of your city and the size of your team. If you're just a team of one, like in some cities I've seen, 
don't try to uh, bite more than you can do. It will blow your mind and you will end up doing 150 hours a week without even starting to touch the data. Thank you very, very, very presentative and to the point. Uh, Gemma and Eduardo, your final thoughts, and if you want to touch on the number issue, but your, your overall, your final thoughts on use cases. Uh, shall I start? Um, well, we start with one use case in Amsterdam, and actually we can already answer with the data that we have, I think, like uh, four or five policy questions. So I think uh, if you have one use case, you can uh, do a lot of analysis with that data. Um, and I think that is the experience that we have for now. Thank you. And, and I would just add to that by saying that uh, well, we, of course, have got one use case per the city that we're working in, but of course, uh, the time, effort and energy that's needed in order to work out that use case and actually take the next steps is, of course, is very large. So I think, uh, yes, don't bite off more than you can chew indeed, because uh, new cases present themselves Thank as you go down the process. Thank you, Eduardo. And finally to you, Alex, your final I thoughts. Yes, I I think the the reality uh, it's it's quite important to remember um, why uh, use cases in the first place, which is uh, you know cities exist uh, to serve kind of the public good and the we 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 uh, they uh, force of habit uh, hold um, the right of way in public trust, um, and I think that's something that's that's quite important to uh, remember as part of this use case process um, is at the end of the day, like the, the use cases are designed to be um, uh, the, the way that we manage uh, the public space better for the benefit of the public. Thank you. And sadly, an hour has gone by. We've had a full conversation. I, again, I'd like to thank uh, Gemma Shepherds, Eduardo Green from the Municipality of Amsterdam, Tutho Tai from Mobility Data, Michael Schnurla from Open, the Open Mobility Foundation, as well as Alex Bohuznik from Vianova for joining us today and sharing with us some of their thoughts on delivering micromobility use cases for global cities. Please listen to our earlier Vianova webinars, as well as read our various white papers and articles, which are available via our website and our LinkedIn page. They contain useful information on new mobility from partners across Europe and the wider world. There will be a um, feedback forum that will pop up on the screen momentarily. But again, all I can say is thank you, keep safe, and have a good rest of your day. And again, thank you to all of our speakers for joining us this afternoon. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.